The Peter Schiff Show. Another volatile day in the stock market sees the major averages closing the day deep in the red. The Dow was down just over 1%, down 180 points. We're at 17,500 and change. The NASDAQ actually got walloped a little more, down just shy of 60 points. That's about one and a quarter percent. I think the catalyst for today's declines was a couple of Fed officials talking about how June is a live meeting, live from the perspective of we might raise interest rates. Now, I don't think it's live at all. I think it's dead. And if it was alive, the stock market decline is going to kill it. Because if Wall Street actually believes that the Fed is serious about raising rates in June, which I don't believe, but if Wall Street believed it, the market would be tanking. In fact, if more people believed it, it would be down a lot more than 180 points today. And in fact, as we got closer and closer to the date that the Fed was theoretically going to raise rates, the market would be so low that any talk of a rate hike would be dead because now the Fed would have to deal with the tighter financial conditions, which is the way they refer to it when the markets are going down. And the Fed doesn't want to tighten monetary policy when financial conditions are tightening on their own, which would be the case. Now, it's interesting, too, when you hear a lot of people talking about, well, why is the Fed now got uh, a June rate hike on the table? I keep hearing people talk about the economy strengthening. The economy is not strengthening. That's just a point. The economy is weakening. Yes, we did get a little data in the last few days that was better than expected, but we also got quite a bit of data that was worse than expected. And in general, most of the data that has come out, in fact, practically all of the data that's come out since the last time the Fed hiked rates has been bad. So if the Fed is talking about raising rates, it's not because the economy is getting stronger. It's despite the fact that the economy is getting weaker. What is getting stronger is inflation. Now, the problem is, even though inflation is now above the Fed's so-called 2% target, I don't think that actually raises the probability of a rate hike. Because if anything, the increasing prices are just going to slow down the economy even more because consumers have to spend money. And if prices go up, that undermines their ability to spend. And it also undermines this whole service sector consumption-based bubble economy. We actually got some official inflation data out today. We got the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, for April. And the consensus was for a move of up 0.3 following the prior months up 0.1. And we got a bigger jump than was expected. We got up 0.4. And the year-over-year increase, this is the headline number, not the core number. And the year-over-year increase is now 1.1. So the year-over-year is still below 2%. But if you annualize that four-tenths, 0.4, if we actually did that for the next 11 months, that would be a 6% annualized rate of uh, CPI-based inflation. Clearly, clearly that's well above 2%. You know, I, I read articles about this big jump in consumer prices today, and the gist of it was this is good news because the Fed is making progress on its uh, policy goal of price stability. Now, if you think about the, the ridiculousness of that comment, so we had a big spike up in, in consumer prices, which if you annualize the rate of increase, you're talking about 6% increase in prices. And that's supposedly progress on price stability. If anything, the Fed is moving away from price stability. Prices were more stable before the Fed went to work on getting them to go up. I mean, we never actually had falling prices, but if your goal is price stability, the less they go up, the more stable it is. I mean, I don't know how much more stability people can stand. I mean, if, they, if price is getting more stable than this, uh, you know, we're going to have runaway inflation. This is not about price stability. This is about generating inflation on purpose uh, because there is no alternative for the Fed. Now, normally, when you get a hotter than expected inflation number, and not normally like for all of history, but normally recently, in the recent past, right? the normal reaction is when inflation comes out higher than people think, the currency goes up. And when inflation is lower than people think, the currency goes down. Now, you might think that that's counterintuitive, and, and it actually it is. Because why would high inflation be good for a currency? After all, inflation is measuring how quickly the currency is losing purchasing power. 
And so if the currency is losing purchasing power more quickly, why would that make the currency more valuable? It, sh it should make it less valuable. And the alternative is, or the converse of that, is if you have low inflation, well, that means your currency is maintaining its value. It's not losing as much purchasing power, which should make owning that currency more desirable, right? You want to hold the currency that maintains its value. But in today's world, low inflation is bad for your currency and high inflation is good for your currency. But the reason for that is because everybody is fixated on central bankers. See, the idea is, well, if inflation is high, that means the central bank of that country is either going to not cut rates, if you were thinking they were going to cut rates, or they might have to raise rates. So it's the tighter monetary policy that people think is the consequence of, of high inflation that is good for the currency. On the other hand, if your inflation is low, with everybody, with all these central banks talking about how low inflation is bad and how if they have low inflation, they have to do something about it, like cut rates or do QE. Then when a country comes out with lower than expected inflation, the currency tanks. That's something that recently happened with the Australian dollar, which fell out of bed because the inflation rate was lower than expected, which long term, I think, is good for the Australian dollar. But short run, it causes everybody to sell. But here is the interesting observation from today. Even though there was a knee-jerk reaction, if you watched how the dollar traded, as soon as the hotter-than-expected CPI number was released, you saw the dollar spike up, and you saw gold go down a bit. But by the end of the day, the dollar was basically flat, slightly negative against some currencies. But the dollar did not have a big gain uh, as a result of the higher-than-expected Inflation. In fact, the dollar index itself closed down ever so slightly. But you would have expected this big rise, especially with a couple of Fed guys out talking about how they might raise rates this in June next month. So the prospect of higher rates and higher inflation did not cause a, a move into the dollar. Same thing with gold, only the opposite. Gold still managed to be up about five bucks today. It did sell off, and it was down a couple of bucks after the worse-than-expected inflation number. But gold caught a bit, and you didn't see a big sell-off in gold. And I think that is a pretty uh, significant indicator that there is a problem. And the problem is people are seeing that, wait a minute, even if inflation is higher than expected, it doesn't mean the Fed's going to actually raise rates because they can't. Because what we have now is stagflation. I've been talking about this all along. This is where we have a pickup in inflation, but not growth. The economy is weakening. At the same time, inflation is picking up. And that puts the Federal Reserve in a very, very difficult position. Because how can they raise rates to fight inflation when they're also worried about the economy? And also, I believe that the employment numbers have already rolled over. So not only is the economy going to be slowing down, and not only will prices be picking up, but unemployment will also be rising. And that's another mandate of the Fed. So what happens if the slowing economy is producing an uh, increase in unemployment at the same time that prices are rising, right? Which monster does the Fed try to slay? Does it go after inflation or does it go after the economy and jobs? And I think it's always going to go for jobs as if there really is a trade-off, which there's not. But they're going to try to artificially stimulate the economy, which means the Fed surrenders to inflation. And the only thing that's really been propping up the dollar is all the tough talk. The Fed talking about how we got inflation expectations well anchored. It's under control. But if inflation ever picks up, we're going to raise rates. That's a bluff. They can't do that. And when the markets figure out that the Fed has been bluffing, that they have no control over inflation, that, that inflation fire, once it's lit, is going to burn unchecked and it's going to turn into this raging inferno, then there's going to be a big run for the dollar. And we've already seen, you know, numbers are coming out today, uh, the Saudis, the Russians, the Chinese moving away from the U.S. dollar, moving more money into gold. In fact, look at the price of oil today. Oil prices, again, I talked about this on a podcast last week. Oil prices continue to rise, crude up about another 70, 80 cents today, about 2%. We're now back above $49 a barrel. We're getting close to 50 bucks. You know, we got as low as 27, 28 earlier in the year. I think that was maybe February. And we've had this huge 70 plus percent rise since then. And, you know, rising gas prices was a big reason why the CPI jumped up so much in April. And that's going to continue based on what's going on. And imagine when the dollar rolls over again, because the dollar hasn't even been falling much, even though oil prices continue to go higher and higher and higher. 
And this is happening with the stock market going down. So this is just making this stagflationary scenario even worse. Now, we got some more economic news that came out today. We got the industrial production numbers for April, which actually were a little bit better than expected, although they revised down the very bad numbers we got from March, and they made those even worse. Uh, so overall, it's about a push, maybe slightly better than expected. But the trend here is is clearly down. You know, one of the, the numbers that I look at a lot, it comes out every week. Nobody ever talks about it. These Red Book uh, weekly year over year same store sales. And we're continuing to hang at the lowest we've been in many, many years. I mean, the chart that I look at just on the Bloomberg web page, you know, the the year over year increase is just 0.5, 0.5. And this is not adjusted for inflation, right? So if year-over-year -year sales are up one-half of 1%, we know inflation is higher than one-half of 1%. And so this means that year-over-year -year sales are, in fact, negative, right, if you adjust for inflation. Now, if you go back to uh, 2014, these numbers were running about a 4% positive rate, right? So year-over-year -year same source sales were going up 4%. And sometimes they were five as high as six percent, and now year over year same store sales are one half of one percent, and it's been stuck in this level ever since early 2016. And to me, in fact, it looks like this number is about to go down, about to be negative, despite the fact that prices are higher. I think sales in aggregate are even going to be down, and we're very close to a breakdown, and nobody is really talking about about that number. Now, yesterday, we got a horrible number from the Empire State Manufacturing Index. This is a May number. And the um, April number came in at 9.56, which isn't all that great, but at least it was a positive number. And uh, it was the first positive number in a while because we had had lots of months where we had negative numbers. And then all of a sudden, we got this positive number and people were thinking, oh, great, maybe this is a turnaround. Uh, they were looking for another positive number in May, just not quite as high. They were looking for seven, but instead they got minus nine. So the whole thing collapsed and the positive number was a, was a one hit wonder and we're already back to negative numbers. So these are, this is the kind of data. If somebody is talking today about, oh, the, the Fed's going to hike because the economy is getting better, data like that is showing that the economy is not getting better, that it's in fact getting, getting a lot worse. Now, one number that did come out better than expected were the retail sales numbers for April. And in my last podcast, I talked about the fact that I had expected that number to be another disappointing number, which, of course, uh, you would have thought had you looked at all the retail sales numbers that were coming out from the actual stores, which were horrible. And in fact, a lot of companies were issuing warnings earlier in the month uh, based on how lousy their retail sales were. So I wasn't expecting... Uh, there to be a better number for April, because if things were picking up, uh, you would have expected some of the retailers to be a little bit more optimistic based on, you know, the spring pickup. So the the March number was down 0.3. And the consensus was for a rise of 0.9. So there already was a lot of optimism, as I said, but the number came in actually quite a bit stronger than that. The actual number was up 1.3%. Uh, so stronger than expected, even if you took out automobile, the number was still up 0.8 versus expectations of 0.5. But when you take out gasoline, uh, you know, the beat is not nearly as big. With X autos and X gas, we were looking for up 0.4 and we got up 0.6. So a big chunk of that 1.3% increase in retail sales is gasoline. And it's not because people are using more gasoline. They're just paying more for the gasoline they use because prices are going up. And so you're going to see gas continue to have a positive impact on retail sales as it gets more and more expensive. But ultimately, of course, it's going to take a bite out of retail sales because, you know, what you spend on gas, you can't spend on, on something else. But in general, the economic news has been weak, yet the inflation news continues to get worse. And that is exactly the opposite of really what the Fed wants. Because in order for the Federal Reserve to maintain its monetary accommodation, it has to be able to do so with a, a backdrop of low inflation or inflation so-called too low inflation, because that's what justifies the cheap money. In fact, the people who are saying that the Fed shouldn't raise rates, their justification is, well, there's no inflation threat. So why should the Fed risk 
raising rates when the economy is not strong, when there's no threat of inflation. So as long as there's no threat of inflation, the Fed has an excuse not to act. Well, what happens when that inflation threat rears its ugly head? Well, now what's the Fed's excuse not to act? And of course, if the Fed does come up with an excuse not to act in the face of rising inflation, that is a huge problem because that means the Fed is going to lose its credibility as an inflation fighter if people see it as an inflation enabler. If it starts making excuses about why higher inflation is okay, uh, then the markets are going to start to be worried. Finally, they should have been worried a long time ago, uh, but people were operating under a delusion, just like, you know, everybody's creditors are operating under delusion until they're confronted with reality. I mean, that was the same thing that happened in Greece. It's the same thing that's happening in Puerto Rico. Uh, You know, the United States is broke. We're as broke, if not broker, than anybody else who's having a crisis right now with respect to their debt. The difference is our creditors haven't woken up to that reality yet. They're still living in a delusion. But the Federal Reserve tolerating higher inflation threatens to pierce that delusion because obviously if they try to do something about the higher inflation in in the form of raising rates tightening monetary policy then the economy is going to crash you know the whole bubble is going to deflate the stock market is going to tank the real estate market is going to tank the bond market is going to tank and then you know then what then we're going to have to follow donald trump right we're going to have to uh, restructure we're going to have to admit that we can't afford to pay our bills because we won't be able to. We can theoretically afford it now only because, A, nobody actually wants their money back. Everybody is willing to allow the debt to to roll over. And B, the interest rates are practically zero. So it doesn't cost us very much to service all the debt that we can't repay. But if interest rates go up and we can't service it, or people realize we can't service it, and then they want their money back because they know that we can't possibly service it, then the whole house of cards collapses. Now, tomorrow we're going to get the Federal Open Market Committee's minutes, right? This is the the record of their last meeting where they did not raise interest rates, you know, but theoretically, you know, they kept the possibility open for a rate hike. So I think these minutes that come out about two o'clock or at two o'clock exactly Eastern time tomorrow, everybody's going to be looking at these minutes and parsing through the words to see if there's something in there that suggests whether or not the Fed is actually about to raise interest rates or not. But of course, all this is really an exercise of futility. It doesn't really matter what they say or what they don't say or what word they include or what word they take out. They're not going to raise rates. I mean, if they were going to raise rates, they would have already done it. In fact, if they were going to raise rates, they would have started raising years ago. They wouldn't have waited until December of last year. They wouldn't have waited for the economy to be on the cusp of a recession to start raising rates. Uh, You know, (laughs) they were hoping to not have to do it at all. Uh, But unfortunately, they did. And now they're in a very, very bad predicament. And they already are talking again about the possibility of negative interest rates because they realize that if they do have to cut interest rates to stimulate the economy, not that it actually stimulates it, but if they do, how much stimulus do you get going from a half a percent to zero? I mean, you got all they have is one rate cut, right? Because they're they're basically between 0.25 and 0.5. So the next move down is between zero and 0.25. And and that's basically it, unless you're going to go below the Maginot line, unless you're going to go, uh, you know, south of Mason-Dixon and, and go into negative territory, which is uncharted territory for the Fed. They've charted it without success in Japan and in parts of Europe. But, you know, the U.S. is far more vulnerable. If the U.S. dollar ever went to negative interest rates as the reserve currency, it would be cataclysmic. I mean, the the carnage in the, the, the foreign exchange markets, what that would do to the dollar, what that would do to the U.S. economy, the Europeans, the Japanese, they're able to get away with it. It's not helping their economies, but they're not imploding either. But I think it would be Armageddon almost for the United States to really go down that route. And I, I don't know if they're going to try it. And I don't even, what if they try it and it blows up? Then what do they do? I mean, do they admit it was a mistake and reverse it? Because then it'll blow up again. It's like the minute they, they go down that route, just like I said with you know the 0% interest rates or the quantitative easing, I said, once you do it, it's impossible to undo it. Well, if we go negative, it's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, for the Fed to dial that back without looking like complete fools once they did it. So things are things are getting dangerous and time is running out. You know, I just read today they put out some numbers 
that showed a lot of the trades and some of the big hedge funds. Interestingly enough, George Soros is back in the gold market. In fact, he bought a big stake in Barrick Gold, and he also bought uh, some call options. He bought some physical gold. Uh, Soros got out gold a couple years ago, and he was still very bearish You know, a year ago when gold was near the lows. But now he's back in. And he's also as short as he's ever been in the U.S. stock market. So he's shorting U.S. stocks and he's buying gold and he's buying gold stocks. You know, on the flip side, John Paulson actually sold off about 14 or 15 percent of his GLD stake in the first quarter. And my bet is he probably sold it earlier in the first quarter when gold prices were still falling. You know, some of these guys that had been long term holders were, were getting nervous, you know, and they were actually selling down their positions. Everybody was scared early January because, you know, the Fed just raised rates in December and everybody believed, oh, the dollar is going to soar, gold's going to crash. And it didn't happen. And, you know, I'm looking at there are actually stocks. I'm looking at there's I looked at a silver stock today. I don't even want to mention it because I don't want people to think that oh, I'm telling you to go out and buy it, although it is a good stock. But it closed at a, at a new 52 week high today. But it's now up five fold. Five times from where it was in January, mid Jan five times. And in fact, in mid January, the stock was down better than 95% from where it was in 2011. Now it's only down 50%. Now that might sound, well, well, it's still way down. It was down 90%. Now it's down 50%. Yeah, but the move from down 90% to down 50% is a five fold increase. So, you know, if you bought it anywhere near those lows, you have a huge gain. And of course, all it has to do is double one more time. And, and now it's all the way back uh, to where it was. But, you know, a lot of the people who were getting nervous about these mining stocks, I'm sure a lot of long term holders in this stock threw in the towel last year or maybe even early this year. And now look at the position they're in. I mean, how do you buy a stock back for four or five times what you sold it for? You know, that's been some of the dangers of the market timing. It's one of the reasons that we've held through this, because I am holding for something much, much bigger. I think a lot of what's gone on in the last four or five years is all a bunch of noise. In fact, even some of these stocks that have had these huge swings, this is going to look like noise. I mean, five, 10 years from now, if these stocks are up another tenfold, 20-fold, 50-fold, uh, the action over the last few years isn't even going to show up on a chart. I mean, that's how much I think the upside is. Uh, in a lot of these mining stocks, because I think there's such tremendous upside in, in the price of gold and in the price of silver, when all the people uh, who have had so much confidence in the U.S. economy, who have had confidence in the Fed, who have had confidence in the Fed's ability to raise rates, had confidence in you know Janet Yellen and Ben Bernanke, and actually believed in the credit worthiness of the United States, actually believed in all these fairy tales. Which to me is kind of like you know you know believing in you know Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy. I mean, maybe you can believe in it when you're a little kid, but there's no excuse for a grown up to believe in that. I mean, so maybe little children, uh, you know, can believe uh, in the U.S. economy or the Fed, you know, but no adult should. I mean, it's so obvious that this thing is a complete disaster. But for some reason, you know, the crowd, conventional wisdom, and people have been buying into this myth and they bought into the dollar, but. At some point, this is going to unravel very, very quickly. When the real move happens, it's going to be swift. It's going to be very, very sharp. And people are not going to have a chance. If you're not on this train, you miss the train. And, and, and so you know, all this stuff is just going to be noise. Because when, when the dollar tanks, it's everybody who's owning these, the dollar. They all need to get out. They all need to pile out or get out of a crowded room at the same time through a tiny little door. And they all try to buy gold. And also, you know, I mentioned these hedge funds. I looked at these lists, you know, all this, the, the stocks that they bought or the stocks that they sold during the quarter. And I think I saw one other hedge fund other than George Soros that bought a gold stock. That's it. Nobody, nobody, nobody bought one in the last quarter. Now, maybe, maybe someone's doing something in the second quarter because obviously someone's buying these gold stocks. I mean, they're going up every day, including today, right? Even with... A 180-point uh, down day in the Dow. The GDX was up 1.35%, and the uh, DDXJ was up almost 3% at a new 52-week high. This is an index of junior gold miners closed at 39.2 today. The low this year in January was 16.87. So basically 16 to 40 in, in four months. That's the junior mining sector. But obviously, if you want to go back to 2011, this index was 160. So it still has to go up fourfold from here to get back to where it was in 2011. And again, if I'm right, by 2020, the 2011 high 
and the 2016 low, you'll barely notice them on a chart because I think these stocks are going to move up so much that all this is going to be a bunch of noise. And so whether you bought at 40 or whether you bought at 20 or 10, you know, it's not going to make much difference if you're in at 20 or 40. If, if you know, you're talking about hundreds of dollars uh, per, you know, per share on this index. But yeah, obviously, sure, buying it cheaper is better. But a lot of people aren't going to buy it at all or they're going to wait until the stock's at new highs. There are a lot of people that aren't going to buy any gold stocks until this index is well above the 160 high that it hit in, uh, in 2011. But I think once we start to break out in these stocks, they're going to move up very, very sharply. You're going to have days where they're up massively and people are going to be too afraid to buy them for a while because they're going to be afraid they missed out. They're going to be afraid. I can't buy it now. It's up so much. Let me wait for a pullback. And then there will be no pullback. It'll just gap up again and they'll still be afraid to buy. And eventually, though, the fear will be you know, replaced by greed. Eventually, these stocks will be up so much so fast that all the people that were too afraid to buy them will be so greedy that they rush and chase them. And then maybe there'll be a pullback. We'll see. I mean, that's kind of what happened in 2011, 2012. A lot of the Wall Street, they watched the gold market from 2000 to 2010, 2011, and they never bought any gold. They never bought any gold stocks. They waited till the absolute highs to pile in. And then when it went down, all those weak hands, they all cashed out. So we could do the same thing again. Although I don't believe that we're going to see the big reversal. Because remember, the only thing that stopped gold from going up the only reason the dollar rallied is because everybody was convinced the Fed was finished printing money. Everybody was convinced the QE was over and the rate normalization was going to begin and that the Fed had saved the day and the U.S. economy had reigned supreme and everything was great and all the naysayers were wrong. When they realized that the naysayers were right and it was all the self-congratulators at the Fed, they were wrong. You know, I wonder if they're going to redo these magazine covers, the, you know, the newspapers that, that, that proclaim Ben Bernanke like he's some kind of superhero. Are they going to do another cover when this whole thing implodes? But when the Fed has to acknowledge the weakness in the economy, regardless of what the excuse is, when they have to acknowledge it, when they've got to take back that rate hike and go to zero or maybe go to negative, when they've got to launch QE4, and they're doing all of this despite the fact that official measures of inflation are going up, not down, and we're well above their supposed 2% ceiling, the dollar is going to fall through the floor and the price of gold is just going to go ballistic. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is. Truth in Media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with TruthinMedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, TruthinMedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make TruthinMedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit TruthinMedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access to Truth and Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.